Thank you all. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> you can be seated. Oh, my God. Thank you all for coming on this Saturday morning. It's, a war it's the warmest place in the town anyway. So. <laughs> we left 81 degrees when we... Yes, thank you for thinking of me. I, would, I forgot. Yeah, we left 81 degrees on the Gulf there. And, um, yeah, and it, but it's still not warm enough for the alligators to come out. So, so we're, we're, th we're thankful about that. They're still in hibernation. Yeah, you can walk by and hit them on the head and they just look at you. You know, they're just, <laughs> they're in a head. It's a crazy, it's crazy what God does. And, um, you know, uh, to come on Saturday morning, it just really blesses me and to see you all coming. And I know what sacrifice that is because I was in your shoes. I, I actually know what you think because I was one. I was just like you. I, I didn't want to go to church on Saturday morning. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, and and uh, you finally make some money, and the last thing you want to do is give ten percent back to God. You know, you you fight that thing. You know, until you get the revelation of it. And it's the same with giving. It's um, Kathy. I didn't. You know, I, I, I'm sorry I'm doing this to you, but the Lord had spoken to me when I was up there in the pastor's office, and he wants me to, out of my our own personal account, to give $1,000 towards the renovation of this building. So you could just make that to the church and, and more, to, more to come. You know, I was praying in tongues. That's what happens when you pray in tongues. You pray in tongues in a, in a pastor's office. Oh, you gotta be kidding. No, I mean, ministers don't do this, you know, it's hilarious. But I don't even, if that, if that's, if, uh, if, if doing this, um, is, 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 is wrong, you know, like if it's wrong, then I would rather not be a minister. I'd rather just come and talk to you about Jesus, you know. And I, I've really thought about that. Actually, I had a choice that nobody knows about except my wife. I actually was told that I could, I could back out January 1st. At, at the end of the three years, I was done with what I needed to do. And um, so I was going to back out. I was going to actually hire people just to do. Uh, our school is over 9,000 now in, in 14 months. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's so many employees that I need, still need to, I need to hire twice as much just to keep up with the explosion. So I was just going to back out and make it more about all of you all and just have people run it and just write books and, and, and back out. And, and what happens is, is in every move of God, they get to, people get too centered on a certain person. And then what happens is they, um, it's built around them and then they don't have anybody to hand it off to because no one can fit in their shoes. Now, this has happened to me already. I've sat in Sid Ross' office. I've sat in Jesse's office, and, you know, I'm not going to tell you what was said, but the bottom line was when I walked out of there, both offices, I, I told myself, I'm not going to allow this, this to happen to where they don't have someone to hand it off to. So, you know, and, you know, the whole, you, you go through, you go through uh, all the different things that happened in the Bible where there was a handoff with generations, you know, God is into generations. He's into family. He's into uh, relationships and covenants and he loves people, but it's a handoff. It's supposed to be, and uh, Jesse's the only one. He said, Kevin, you're going to be bigger than me. He said, I'm giving you everything. He said, you can have everything. He said, I'm even giving you my sword so I can't even hurt you. He said, you have my weapon. I can't hurt you. I'm not kidding you. That's what he did. He said, but you're going to be bigger than me. And I go, I don't want to be bigger than you. I don't even want to do this. And he said, it doesn't matter. God is in to handoffs. He's into generational handoffs. And the bottom line is, I can't be Jesse Duplantis. And um, I, I just want his hair and he wants my height. That's what he's told me. So he... he <laughs> so... And it's the same with Sid Roth. He's a general, but see, I can't be Sid Roth. But, you know, I started my own network. I started my own school, you know, and I'm, I'm going to start my own publishing house. I'm going to start, I'm just going to own everything. And then, you know, and then, and then if, 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 if uh, everyone isn't offended by all that, I'm going to start my own airline. And then what I'm going to do is for free, if pastor needs to go somewhere and preach, I'm just going to take him for free. Here you go.
So what I'm saying is, if it being a ministry is not that, then I don't want to be a minister anymore. Do you get it? So I was going to back out and get my own jet and just do all this stuff on my own. It not as non, it's not as nonprofit, just just to get out of the whole thing. I was just going to say, you know, I don't care how much money I lose. I'm just not going to do it for under this this uh, culture that's developed in ministry that I don't think's right. No, 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 there's a lot of people that are upset with me because I talk like this because I'm, I'm flipping tables everywhere I go. But see, what happened to the Pharisees is that Jesus showed up and they didn't know what to do with him, but they were supposed to be preparing the people for him. Right? But what it became about them. That's what ministry has become. It's become about them. But see, I'm supposed to be preparing the way of the Lord. I'm supposed to decrease. He's supposed to increase, you know. So it's more about the people. And so I, they, my mission statement for, for Warrior Notes as, as, a, as an underlying joke among the, my partners and among my employees and my students is this. I'm a Robin Hood. I'm essentially taking from the rich and giving it to the poor. But in a sense, what I'm doing is I'm bringing the ministry back to the people. Instead of it being a hierarchy where if you're not an apostle, you can't even, you know, you can't do this stuff. In other words, Jesus died so that we can all do this. No, no, honestly, no, be on, let's be honest, okay? Because when I met Jesus, he's the apostle of my faith. He's the fi- author, the finisher of my faith. He's the commander of my faith, okay? So everything is dictated by him as his personality, as re- the relationship that we have together. It's not some system that I work and I bend his arm to give me something that he already wants to give me. I'm not going to say something 500 times to get him to give me something that he already wants to give me. That's not relationship. Okay, so what did he say? He said, those who are apostles, will, these signs will follow them. No. He said, those who believe, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So the prophetic has become pathetic. <laughs> and the apostolic has become, you come to me because I'm the man of God or the woman of God. That's not, a, an apostle is called a sent one. So get off your, get off your butt and go, <laughs> right? Yeah. You notice I'm not wearing a face mask. Because the viruses run. Yes, they do. No, no, honestly, let's be honest. If you died and came back and you, you were told you can't fail, would you be wearing a face mask? Okay. All right. So here's what's happening. The handoff is happening for this generation already. And I'm not going to wait to get to the place where I'm sitting and saying, I don't have anybody to take this. So the Lord said, you can do another seven years. You can do seven. I was just going to back out. I was just going to actually just, uh, we formed a band, and we're, we're just going to do a worship band. That's what we're going to do. And, we're, and so we, what I did was we, uh, how many know who Keith Ellis is, my friend Keith Ellis? Yeah. A true prophet. Yeah. Okay, but he's been a pastor for 40 years. And he doesn't want anyone to know who he is. He doesn't want anyone calling him, even though everybody that you can name on Christian TV calls him to get a word. But he, he called me, and this is what he said. He, he said, you need an office. I said, no, I don't. I said, Jesse DePlantis told me that, and I don't need an office. I got my house. It's free. It doesn't cost the ministry anything. Well, you, you need people to, you know, to pack your boxes, and, and when you go to churches and stuff like that, you need to be able to help you. I said, no, me and Kathy can do that, and we can do what it takes somebody to do. It takes them 16 hours to pack for a church. It takes us three. So why would I want to pay somebody to do it? But I do. Okay. And that's finding people that can do that. But the, I was told, you know, you need this, you need this, you need this. And I'm like, no, we're fine. And he goes, Jesse goes, Kevin, he goes, you got DVDs and CDs in your house all over the place. You know, you just put uh, cotton, uh, you know, table covers over them and you can make them into tables. He says, you, you know, you need an office. So this is how, this is how the Lord moves upon you. You see, you're just a normal Christian, and God wants to take you to the next step. But you're you're like, Lord, if we're not if if you're not going, we're not going. So that's what I did with everything, with everything. Now I'm going to tell you some stories this morning, 
And I'm going to show you how God wants to, to stretch your borders out on how you think and how you frame your world. And, and the bottom line is you're living, you're living lower than you should. But the reason why is you think you're being humble and religious over it. Your thinking is you're being, you think you're being humble. But see, G- Jesus, Jesus was, had a command about him. And when he died on the cross, he, he, said, he said through Paul now that we can have exceedingly abundantly above what we could ask or think. And then if you look at the flavor of John chapter 14, 15, and 16, you can see that we're living way below. And, and um, I'm not a beggar. Okay, so Keith Ellis calls me, which he does. He always backs up what's going on. The Lord talks to me, then Jesse talks to me, and then Keith talks to me. It's wild. And my wife is always talking to me. She's always praying. She's always praying for me because this has been a rocket ride. Now, I'll show, you, I'll show you how much of a rocket ride this has been. This has only been three years. And I'm ready to retire again. <laughs> we have to go. We, we have to go out of the churches now, and we have to get conference centers everywhere we go. We can't even go in the churches anymore. Okay, so there was, there was, this, uh, there was this program that developed uh, the space shuttle. It was called the X-15. And they would drop it from the bottom of a B-52, which is a big bomber, at 31,000 feet. Then the rocket ship would go past six times the speed of sound. And it would go to 300,000 feet, right to, the, right to the edge of space, and then they'd bring it back in. And they kept doing this and doing this to develop what, what we have today as a space shuttle. And then we have the Aurora, which is classified, so don't say that. Hope they're not filming this. But they have the Aurora now that goes, that goes Mach 7. In fact, uh, one, one of the, the tracking, the trackings they did with radar, this, this, this aircraft went from Sacramento, from Beale, to, you're not the CIA, are you? So many, you don't, yeah. I just have to watch him when I'm talking about this. The men, he didn't have black on, so I, it's not the men in black. It's like, okay. But, but anyway, they, they, uh, they tracked this thing. It took 33 minutes to get to Hawaii from, from California. And it turned around and came back. There's stuff like that going on all the time. Okay, so there, there's, there's this, but it started with this black rocket ship that had, it looked like a yard dart. It didn't even have wings, hardly. But um, the pilot would get in there. And Chuck Yeager started this when he broke the sound barrier in the X1, X2, and then it went on to this X15, and they dropped him out in a spacesuit, and then as soon as they dropped away, then he would hit the ignition, and they'd start going up. And they were supposed to let it burn for just a certain amount of time, and there was, there was some extra fuel on board, but he, he held it for eight more seconds. On the, the burn went eight more seconds longer than it was supposed to just eight seconds he broke all the records he still holds the record today but when he came back in you know it's all stationed so that like wherever he was launched he goes up into orbit comes back in then he can make his turn and and land at edwards air force base in in california it's a dry lake bed. It's, it's miles and miles and miles of desert that are made into runways. So that, you know, even if you made three mistakes, you could still live, you know, on the approach. Because there is no missed approach. There is no way of going around like you do in an airline. You know, you just can't pull the throttle forward and go around and try again. There is no second try. So when he came back in, he's supposed to see Edwards Air Force Base out his side window as he's tilting, coming back in, and he starts burning in the atmosphere and then uh, it's designed to, to be able to withstand all that. And then he just loses a bunch of altitude. He's going seven times the speed of sound. He's got to land at about 200 miles an hour. So he's got to slow it down and he has all that to do. And then he goes right in and lands. When So he's going facing south. When he comes back in, he's supposed to see California and then the Sea of Cortez, Mexico, 
and then the Pacific Ocean would be off to his left or his right, but he can't see that because he's tilted this way, so he's looking down. When he comes back in, he sees the end. He sees Central America. So he has to turn around. And he barely makes it. He's scraping, he's scraping cactus on, the, on his approach. Barely makes it in, landing opposite the way he's supposed to. Just because of an eight-second more burn. This is the kind of thing that happens in the spirit. Because the spirit doesn't have clocks on the walls. The, the, the heaven doesn't have clocks. The, the, the references... The references are little are places where God has spoke. They're not a timeline. They're not a calendar. So when you were at the throne room, you were at the center of the universe, and everything came to the throne room. You didn't, you know, you didn't have to go anywhere. And um, when I was with Jesus, he would he had such authority that he would just go like this, and he was talking about a certain place that I've never been to before. And when he went like this, the destination had to come to us. It would come and be around us, and I'd look, and we're there. But I didn't move. That's how much command he has. So you can understand, I want to have three feet of hair. <laughs> because to me, like, this is ridiculous to not have three feet of hair, because I can have anything I want. Right? Okay, that's the mentality you get from being over there. And you'd be mad at my driveway, because it's gold. And you're like, this is such a waste. Yeah, and then when I'm not looking, you're chipping a piece out to take back with you. <laughs> See, this is such a waste, you know, but you'll steal, you'll steal from my driveway. <laughs> okay, so I t this, this all should encourage you to show you that there's so much more. There's, there's, there's so much more to what's going on in our lives and, and what is available to us than we know. And because I come back and I appear to be a spoiled brat. I appear to be a spoiled brat. I really do. Because I already know what my father wants. And I'm waiting for this realm to, cut, to get with it. And, and I'm waiting for people to understand that, that what Jesus did was he, he bought us back so that we're even better than Adam. That, you know, not only did he restore Adam, but he, he was a second Adam, but he restored us back. Okay, with that, and um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out how the Lord wants me to do all this. Something going on here. I have to be sensitive to what he's saying. Um, I'm going to have to go in a different direction this morning, if you don't mind. It'll still be about healing, but it's, it's a different direction. What's, what's happening is this. The process of how you get to walking with God, it's not just an impartation. That's why I'm really against just, just constantly praying for people and, and having them fall down and hit, get hit by God. And then they walk to their car and the, the same devil that's bothering them is there again. And I don't feel like I've really got, Jesus is a problem solver. He's just, he has solutions. He doesn't just do things to, to get you by another day. But we have this mentality, if I can just get through today, or if I can just get through this job interview. But the thing of it is, is in the spirit where there are no clocks, you're already sitting at your desk at your new job, and you haven't even done your interview yet. So if God was to really speak to you, you'd be asking for healing. He's, he would say right away, you're healed. But see, that's too much to bite off for, for most people. So anyway, I get another seven-year lease where I have to do this for seven more years, in a, in a, but in a different angle, of course. But I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be like Jesus. If everyone else is like Jesus, then we're fine. We're going to get along. But if not, guess what? I'm going to have to do it on my own, which is not really, you know, my cup of tea. I like to be second in command so that because they, they always fire at the person in charge. So I just hide behind the pastor. No, I'm serious. We 
we we would we would uh, help pastors start churches, and we did that for years. It, working full time, didn't get paid. We would help people, whatever they needed, parking lot, setting up, music, whatever it was, cleaning toilets. We did it all, and we didn't get paid. But now somebody helps me, they want to get paid oh, right. because it's a different world. But see, these people are going full time with me. They need to get paid. But it's a different world that we live in. Whereas as I was told to go to the marketplace and work and be a Christian and then help the church. So the, the Lord prospers me at my job. Then I bring the money in and I give it to the church to help the church. That's how it's supposed to work. So now as a minister, I, me and my wife just haven't given up on the giving thing just because we're ministers now. We're still sowing because we're addicted to it. Okay, it's the same thing with everything else. Jesus told me, and, and, and you'll hear me say this on Sid Roth because he said the whole world needs to hear this. I said, I said he said, S what, what do you tell people, Kevin? Because... The problem that we had when we when we talked to him the first time, he said, you you are different. And I go, I know. I know I'm different. He said, but you brought it back with you. Everybody has a story when they're on, on my show. You brought the presence. You brought it back with you. I go, I'm sorry. I just, you know, no, you know. It's because something happened to my spirit. When, you know, Jesus talked for 45 minutes and something happened inside of me. And that something that happened inside of me was transformation. So I don't need a fire tunnel. I don't need hands laid on me. And I don't need a word. I don't need a word. I have never woke up and said I need a word. I've never asked for a touch. I've never asked for money. I've never asked the Lord for money. In fact, Kathy knows this. I haven't prayed for myself in almost 12 years. I pray for everybody else. I pray for people that I see on Facebook and they end up in my meetings because I'm praying the fire down on them and I'm saying, Lord, bring them to my meetings so I can prophesy over them. And they show up. I can see them in, in the crowd. I've never met them. So ministry is supposed to be an outflow. Okay, so everyone is supposed to receive from the Lord and then bring it into the house. So he, I told him, I said, he said, what do, he said, you have this ability to relate to people. I go, has it come to that? <laughs> Jesus told me to lay down and be a bridge that people can walk over. I lay my life down. That's what Jesus did for me. I lay it down. It's a privilege. Okay. But with that, I told him, I said, because he asked me, he said, well, what about, we get all these letters about the disconnect. He said, with you, you're, you, you actually do the best of anybody on the shows. But it's because of, of the fact that people relate to you. And that's what Jesse told me. He says, you're always going to be a flight attendant praise in tongues. You never change. You never get. And, and, um, and uh, that's what Sid. Sid calls me every week. He says, please stay humble. You know, Jesse goes, be humble. You know, the people above me say, just stay humble. I'm like, well, I can't do this without him. So, <laughs> but see, I'm, I'm in a pickle which is a good pickle. Okay, so this is what I told him, because they were asking about healing. What, you know, people are not receiving their healing. You know, they're buying the books, they're buying the CDs on my show, and, and he said, they're, all the people we have on, they have miracles in their ministries. But, and I said, well, that's easy. I said, you, Jesus told me not to wait until you're in the ambulance going to the hospital to quote your healing scriptures. He said, you feed on it and you sow into your life. He goes, the world needs to hear this. I go, you know my phone number. But th listen, listen to this. It's, be it's better than that. There's only one person that's alive right now that I know of that talks to me like Jesus did, and that's Jesse. He talks to me just like Jesus did, but he doesn't limit me. I had to cover my laptop because it had an apple on it, and it's, that's a satanic symbol. So people were mad at me. So I cover it with the world. 
can't believe it. you know that's a bite out of an apple and that's the apple that Adam and Eve ate and that's they they launched it at six hundred and sixty six dollars and I'm like it doesn't crash like my PC does I go please just leave me alone I go and besides that just give me scripture where it says that it was an apple because it was a fig. It was. If you're all of a sudden naked, you'd grab the first thing that you just ate the, off that tree. You'd, you'd grab those leaves. What was it? Fig. What did Jesus curse? He hates religion. See, man's solution is cover yourself up. Everything's going to be okay. Jesus, God said no. Here's some animal skins. I just killed some animals. You wear these. See, the solution was blood. Jesus looked at that tree and he hated sin. He hated what Satan did to man. So he cursed that tree because it was God, that was not God's solution. He was God's solution. So he hung himself on that cursed tree. I still eat figs. They're good. Okay. Well, 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 what do we have here? Just going right along here. So when you go into the spirit realm, when you walk in the spirit every day, like I am, I'm walking in the spirit right now, but I'm standing here on a Saturday morning doing something that I would normally not do on a Saturday morning, and neither would you. But why did you come? Is because you're hungry and you want to know God and you want to be changed and you don't want to have to fall on the floor to get it done. You don't want to have to wait for three hours for me to touch you in a line. You want impartation. Well, impartation comes when you have an impartation and you give it out. You do that by sowing into your spiritual life. So when is the parable of the sower about money? It was never about money. The parable of the sower is really the parable of the soils, Jesus told me. And he said that he spent a sentence explaining who the sower was, explained in a sentence what the seed was, and spent paragraphs on the soil. So I think that it's more important to talk about the soil. Well, Jesus said that the the soil represented man's heart, and that the word of God was the seed. Okay, so if the word of God is a seed, then what I was talking about last night at this table that God sets before you in the presence of your enemies, according to Psalms 23, that all these benefits have been set on the table and the enemy has to sit there and watch you be honored. That's what it says. And if you look it up in the Passion Translation in the Aramaic, it says this. It says that, that he is honoring you in the presence of your enemies. So you get fed all these benefits. So you don't want to just pick prosperity. You want to eat other things too as well. Healing. You want to sow into your spiritual life. Okay, you do that by what we did. We 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 uh, were unpaid staff for years. I had been to heaven, but I never told anybody. So I didn't even get the pulpit. I got a Sunday school class. And I taught that as though it was the last thing I'm going to do on earth. And you know what happened? Everybody wanted to come. All of a sudden, you couldn't explain it. There are people waiting to get in the room to be in my Sunday school class. And then after that, I was faithful there. Then I was asked, I was, I was asked, what else would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to help with the music. And they go, what, what are you going to play? And I go, nothing. I don't know how to play anything. <laughs> but what happened was at home, the, the, we, did, we, were, we didn't even have money for a dryer and a washer. So we had a closet that was empty in our apartment. So I, I had bought a keyboard for, a, you know, you probably don't know who this guy is, Israel Houghton, but I had bought a keyboard to, for him to use. I didn't even know how to play it. But he wanted to do an album. I think he came out with a couple, didn't he? But see, his first album, that's, my, that's our keyboard. And, and the same with Eddie James. His first album was that keyboard that I have. Well, I thought, you know what? These guys look, acted like they were born with this talent. 
And so I asked Israel, and he goes, no. He said, I practice eight hours a day. Well, that was different than what I've been told, you know, and thought about ministry and things. So I, um, I had Kathy, you know, it's one of those foldable door things. So she would just close it in behind me, and then I would have that keyboard in there, and I would pray in tongues, and I would just play uh, notes, and then made it into chords, and uh, prayed in tongues for hours. And that's how now I put out my albums. I can play all these instruments, but I started with that room. And I just sewed into it. And the, you know, the, uh, the first and the second album were all with Jesse's band. I played about four instruments on there, and then they, they filled in the rest. But on the third one, the Lord told me to do it on my own. When I went to give it to them, they said, we can't do any better. You know, it's fine just the way it is. That's how much it had excelled, the gifting. But I prayed and I, I sewed into it and prayed in tongues. And I, I, mean, I had a music degree, so I understood how to write. And I'm a voice major, so I can sing, but I can't play instruments. But I can write for them because this is like math. And on, on the scores, you just keep writing the different parts down. So you, you look and you make sure that nothing's conflicting so that the flute player doesn't throw his flute at you. You, you, you know, and then it's just like, um, was it Beethoven? Was it Beethoven? He wrote that, he wrote that, uh, yeah, yeah, and then he, he, uh, he wrote it in a, overnight, and he used to fast. Anyway, the violinist came and said, this, this violin part is unplayable. It's not, it's not possible to play this. He goes, do you think that I was thinking of you, you and your little fiddle last night when the Lord Almighty gave this to me? <laughs> do it. Because it had 32nd notes ripped up, you know, and 64th, you know, ripping up and down. And the guy was opting out. And I saw that there was no real limitation in heaven. It was based on everything down here. You know, the strings of a violin start smoking when you do 64th <laughs> notes, you know, ripping through them. But it's amazing to me how, like, I watched the development through all these things. Uh, the same with healing. How I developed in healing was I just kept, I just picked one scripture and just kept meditating on it and thinking about it. And then I would picture that word being eaten in, the, my, in my body and a bread just being nourishment. And then that word would start to heal my body. And, and then when the glory comes in, like it's going to come in just a few minutes here. When it comes in, you, 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 you act like a sponge and you see the glory going into your cells of your body and telling any ro rogue cell that's developing into cancer, you tell it to go in Jesus' name. You tell it to be destroyed in Jesus' name. You start to take that from the spirit realm. That's what I saw. And, and so I, when I told Sid Roth that, I said the parable of the, of the soils was is that people need to be sowing into their life in whatever areas are, are needed, but it, they should do it preemptively, not when it's needed. Yeah. You, not, so in other words, be proactive about it. So into healing, so into all these different things that, 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 that are benefits of the covenant. So I started to do that. And when I did the third album, I did the whole thing myself. And it's a joke. It was in my office. I just hook up all my instruments to my laptop and I play the track. And I go back and I go, okay, I'm going to put some keyboard here and then I'm going to put my flute here. And I got my Kenny G sax. I'm going to put that right there. And you heard of a thing about the Kenny G sax, right? I met him. It's hilarious. This whole thing's rigged. It really is. But you just don't know it. You're, you come here to hear these stories, but this is, I'm, not, I'm telling the story not for myself, for you. I'm not impressed with myself. I really am not. Because if you knew how much I'm like you, you'd have your own meetings, which is exactly what I want them to do. Okay, so when, when we, we, not, we, we, we launched them on Sid Roth, I give my new albums to Sid Roth every year to launch, to help him out on his network, because he's done so much for me. Billboard Charts called me, and I thought it was a joke because I'm not living in my car in Hollywood or in Nashville waiting to be recognized. So I had to have, I had Andrew and I had a couple other people call 
And they go, no, this guy's like number seven. He's charting on Monday. I go, this is a joke. I did this in my, I did this. I didn't even do it in my garage. I did it in my office, you know. I, I'm serious. Okay, listen. So I'm telling you this because you just sow into your heart. You sow into your heart the word of God in whatever area. And it, it takes a while, but then it's exponential once you start producing a harvest. And see, we have it wrong because we use all these scriptures about money to get money, you know. But the thing of it is, is Jesus told me, no, I give you, first of all, I designate by your name provision. Then I give you the vision. I do it opposite. So essentially, he's already provided for what he's about to tell you before he tells you. It's the other way around. So this building program here, the provision was already designated before it was spoken out to do it. So that's why, I mean, you know, I need my money. That was my personal money. It wasn't from offerings. But I'm giving it to this because I believe in the vision for this place, personally. So I'm sowing into it. But see, that was already predetermined before I was born. But I have to have money to give money. So you sow, you sow into prosperity, but that's not, that's not the seed. Seed isn't money. Okay, so you want you want you want a visitation. You want habitation. Well, then what you do is you you don't leave Exodus twenty nine through thirty three. You put yourself in the cleft of the rock and you hold on because God's going to walk by. This is what I did for years. As a flight attendant, I would pray in tongues and wait for God to walk by. I would place myself in the Scripture. That's how I prayed. I didn't pray for things. I prayed for him to come by me. He's already in me, but I want a relationship with him. Okay, so, so I, I, have to, I have to bend your borders out further now. It's going to be very, uh, it's not going to be pretty. But you understand that we're supposed to be walking in divine health. I mean, what did I say last night? They left Egypt. None of them were sick. They didn't get sick. The only reason they died is because they were in disobedience. They were in unbelief. Unbelief is the big sin. Not the little things that you do that you think you're going to hell for. You know, I've never smoked. But if I go out there and smoke a cigarette, I'm going to come back in here and preach just like I was. That's stupid what I just did. But that doesn't send me to hell. That what that does is it shows that I'm no different than the world, which is the greater sin, because I'm a witness. What makes me different from the world is I don't need that stuff. I don't need anything. Anything that's going to try to entrap me, I'm going to walk away from. I don't care what it is. I gave up for my pastor's wife. I gave up hamburgers for eight months. I took the money and put it in a jar, and I gave it to her. I've done that for children, bought violins for them. I fasted nine months, two meals a day, put all the money in a jar and bought a violin. When I can go to the, my account and just pay for it, the Lord said, no, this is going to cost you. But I invested in some girl that will never forget that. Okay, it, it's the same thing with, with your life. You, you are a seed, been planted, and you produce a crop. But how, how much you produce... I mean, people are, people have, my friends have criticized me. You know, you're working too hard. You, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, you're putting out eight. Well, it just, uh, just this year, just, just this last year, I think I put out seven or eight study guides. And then the four, four major releases on the books or three major releases on the book. Preached 300 times. I already have books that are almost written for 2021 and 22. Last year, I think we did 75 CDs. Fasted and prayed, me and Kathy, before I did every one of them. 
I mean, got to where when I was talking, the house was shaking as I was speaking into those, those CDs in, on a different subjects that the Lord would tell me about. But people were telling you, you need to back off. It's like, okay, well, then who's going to do it? The only reason I'm back here is because someone else messed up and didn't do it. The only reason I'm doing albums is because someone else is supposed to do it. I'm not even a musician. I don't want to be. I actually want to go fishing right now. <laughs> not here, of course. <laughs> but, but me and my wife, we go to the shooting range. You know, I like to, I'm in retirement. Okay, but I sow my life. And when I sow my life, it's got to count because it costs me a lot. But I would do this if it, if it, you know, we used to do this for free where we would just pay for it. We would actually work extra and we would actually do this for free. We would actually pay. Okay, because we're, we're a seed to sow it. It's the same way with healing. If you don't grasp the fact that there are enough scriptures in the Bible that clearly show that you're supposed to be healed and that I have lost just this last year, I've lost a lot of precious friends. Well, that wasn't God's will, but I prayed and I asked God what to do. And he told me what to do. And what it was is, is that I had to pray that their eyes would be open and that they would receive the revelation because see, what they've done in their life is all culminated to a certain point where there is a manifestation in their body. Okay, so it has to do with a whole bunch of different things that work over the years. So if you, if you would pray in the spirit, God would tell you not to eat certain things anymore. He would tell you not to do certain things anymore. But see, I'm not like the world because I'm not even from this place. I'm visiting. And so are you. You really are. When you're born again, you're a new species. Yeah. It says a new species in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I saw that we, well, I can't say that because I'd get kicked out of church. But Jesus said it. I'll just say what Jesus said. He said, ye are Elohim, to whom the word of God was given. And it cannot be reprimanded. It cannot be revoked. Peter said, we're partakers of the divine nature. Well, explain that. Nobody wants to. You're not going to see, I mean, I could name the people that, that have 50, 60,000 people in their church. They're not going to talk about this on Sunday because it's controversial. They're not going to say that God wants you healed all the time because what happens if 30,000 of the 60,000 don't get healed? Well, then they have to change their doctrine to keep the people. But see, the thing of it is, I saw that whether you live or die, you're going to heaven as a, as a Christian. You, you can't lose. You, you don't want to come back here. This place is messed up, and it's not your fault. We're the solution, but we have to become separate from the world in order to make a difference. So we're problem solvers. We have solutions, but we are the solution. Because we're a seed. Our seed is our born again spirit inside of us that we, that God plants. And now we're not just, we're not, not living down here permanently. We're visiting. And so the, the mentality in your mind, you have to shift the way that it's spoken of in the Bible. You have to shift towards that. If you don't, you're going to be just surviving down here. Now, I know what I'm talking about. And I know I'm risking a lot, but the thing of it is, I really don't care anymore. I really don't care. I love people so much that I don't care what they think. I'm going to tell them the truth. I, I really don't. I really don't care. You know, I'm actually, I, I'm actually do doing things now hoping that people will say no. I make it so that it's so hard that people say no. We can't do that. Well, you're doing it to me. Why can't I do it to you? I think the bank should pay me. No, I'm serious. Dear Lord, 
my wife had to go and, and remind them of the stuff to animal because we opened a checking account. Now, now because it's gotten really big, now they're our friends. They'll do anything for us. Well, what was it when we were begging for the coffee pot and the, and the stuffed animal? No, I'm serious. Oh, I could tell you stories. Oh, my gosh. The, 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 whole, the whole thing is, is if you're sick, you're in debt. You're in debt. Your body is demanding something. You can't pay it. See, your body is made to heal itself. But because of the fallen world, it doesn't have the nutrients. It doesn't have everything necessary in order to do it. So you could, you could eat stuff that will kind of help mend your body if you knew what it was you needed. But see, the, the pharmaceutical industry knows how to mask yeah, yeah. the symptom so that you feel better, but it doesn't do anything to solve it. Now, I'm not saying that about everything because, you know, there are, there are you know, and I, this is what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, you know, I'm, I feel like the Lord's bringing me back into, you know, I'm not looking at my notes, but uh, this is good. This is going to be a really good chapter in the book too, because people need to hear this stuff. I don't stop going to the doctor when I'm sick. I let him tell me I'm well. I've had him happen. happen. He's like, my doctor said, I have never seen anyone's eyes reverse ever. My optometrist, same thing. Never heard of it. Well, he said, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. But our doctor, I say, yeah, I don't need to. He's like, never heard of it. Kathy goes, so I go in for my yearly checkup. And I, and then to be, you know, when I go back to being pilot in command of, 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 I, I almost slipped and said my jet. But, you know, I, I, you can usher me out if you want. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to doing the training whether, whether people like it or not. It's my money. It's not offering money. But, but I'll, have to, I'll have to every six months go through a physical to be pilot in command of my own jet. Okay, so I have to do like an extensive thing. So... I'm going to have to see my doctor six times, you know, every, every six months. Okay. But it's interesting that when we asked, when we were talking to him and I go, he goes, you're doing really well. And I go, yeah. And I go, I'm believing for my thyroid that it's going to completely reverse. Cause you know, I have so much exposure to radiation because of the security and then being up there, there's planes always, uh, they're always scanning you. There's all kinds of radar and that that's hard on your thyroid. And, um, so I said, yeah, and I, I'm just believing I'm going to be, you know, be taking off the thyroid medicine. Because it's, it's not God's will. He's Mormon. And Kathy goes, is there anything we can pray for you about? No, he's examining me. He goes, yeah, my wife, my wife, she had cancer or something like that? Colon cancer or something? He says, yeah, sure. Drops his clipboard, his stethoscope, and holds hands with us, and we pray for his wife for healing. This is Christianity. Now, I didn't have to wait until the glory cloud came in. Because I have my wife. She just grabs the people's hands. She says, you, you need to get saved. You need to get, right? Do you, do you, know, do you know this? I walked away from, from the whole, whole, whole fighter pilot thing. And when I went to Southwest Airlines, I thought it was a joke. Because he, I thought I was going to be a pilot for them. And the Lord said, no, you're going to be a flight attendant. And I go, you're having a bad day. I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. Because there's no way I'm going to be a flight attendant, okay? you got to be kidding me. So I had to go through all that. It was just like drama every day. It's like drama every day. You, you, don't, you have no idea, unless you are flight. Okay, so. A Mormon captain comes to me. And he says, I heard... You just got started with Southwest and you want to be a pilot. I go, well, I did. I said, I, I gave that all up uh, to follow the Lord. I'm, a, I'm going to be a minister. And I said, I, you know, I, actually, I don't know why I'm here. But <laughs> if God talks to you, please tell me. You know. He goes, well, um, he said, the Lord, he said, uh, when I was 16 years old. Now, I'm, I'm talking to somebody right now. See, there's a handoff. There's impartation. When I was 16 years old. I used to go to the fence, this captain said, 
put my finger through those that fence and watch the planes from the uh, the little airport there. They would the pilots would come in, check in, get their keys, and come out, and they would be instructed to fly by this guy who owned the the airport in this little school. And uh, he said one day the guy noticed that I had been there several times. So he, he, the captain said, so here's the story that I, this is why I'm going to do what I'm going to do for you, Kevin, is because this guy came up to the fence and he said, you want to fly? He goes, yeah, but I don't have money. He goes, you don't need money. He said, can you wash airplanes? He goes, yeah. So he started washing airplanes and the guy gave him up to his com commercial pilot's license for free. He said, all I, pro all I want you to do is promise me before you die that you do it for someone else. He said, Kevin, you're the person. I'm about to retire. He'd been a captain for, for Southwest for 30 years. And he said, my sons, one's in, uh, a, a medical, uh, he's, a, he's in the aerospace, but he's a, he's a doctor. And then one is a mechanic for Southwest. And he said, you're the man. So he did. He gave me the whole thing. It was about, about $300,000 worth of training for free. He's a Mormon. So I got all my ratings that way. He gave me a car and a place to stay at his house. So I'd fly in from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I just graduated from college there. I would fly in there early. We would fly for a couple days, and then I'd go to work and fly at the airline, then fly a little bit more and then fly back and have two days off and then do the same thing. I did that for nine months and got my commercial pilot's license. It's three years it usually takes. But I didn't want that guy to change his mind, so I just. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I saw things coming back to me. Like my healing has come to me in different waves. And it, it's not, it's not predictable, the timing. The bottom line is, is that even Peter's mother-in-law, when Jesus prayed over her, it says it left her within the hour. And there were times where Jesus had to lay hands on a man because he just saw trees instead of humans. Then the second time, the man received. It wasn't the power that was lacking there. It was the receiving. The glory's coming in right now. Man, I love this part of the service. Thank you, Father. The Lord doesn't consider your sickness ending in death. Many people go through life wishing they could understand the realm of the spirit and the warfare that goes on behind the scenes. In his brand new study guide and three CD set, The Notes of a Warrior, Volume 1, Dr. Kevin Zadai helps you to develop your ability to engage the enemy on every level. Kevin's brand new study guide and three CD set, The Notes of a Warrior, Volume 1, will help equip you to learn to recognize God's direction for your life, encounter clarity in knowing God's battle strategies against your enemies, exercise your authority as a believer, walk in increased discernment through the Holy Spirit's power, and much, much more. In this exclusive offer, Kevin also prays impartation prayers on each CD to help you in your advance against the enemy. Order today Kevin's brand new study guide and exclusive three CD set, The Notes of a Warrior, Volume 1, for a donation of $29, US shipping and handling included. To order, call 888-340-1460 with offer code 1002, or go online to kevinzadai.com slash offer. It's time to stand up for your rights as a Christian and give the devil a headache. He is the healer. That's all he knows how to do. So I focus on getting closer and closer to him 
and letting his presence start to affect my body. Because I'm spoiled. I've met him. It's not fair, I know. But I'm held at a higher accountability now to tell you the truth. This is not a game. This is not a money-making scheme for me. I could go anytime I want. I've actually had the Lord Jesus come and say, you can come and be with me now. He even told me, he said, I can't stand to be away from you. That's what he told me. But I don't say that because people get mad. They get jealous. But that's what he said to me. And I said, Lord, if I drop dead right here on this airplane, everyone knows I'm a Christian here. And they're going to always wonder what happened. I said, I can't let you do this right here. He was right. It was at 35,000 feet. I was serving. And I turned to go out with my tray. And he's standing there. And he just motioned for me to wait. And he stood there and he talked to me. And he said, you've been faithful. You've, you've told people. You've told people. You've ministered to everyone that I had destined for you to minister to. And he said, you've completed everything. Uh, uh, the 12 people I'd met. Uh, I had come to the end of that line that he showed me in heaven. I, he showed me a, a group of people, and I knew their names. I knew that, about them, and I, it took 20-some years to meet them all. But when I met them, I knew who they were, and the, um, I would feel the Lord come and stand beside me on my right hand, and then the angel would be behind me, and I would just start prophesying to these people. And then they would get saved. Someone would get saved. So he, I said, I like this. I said, well, can you keep doing this? Because I'll stay a little longer. And he said, okay, I'll extend it out. And then it started to open up into this. But I want to tell you how this, how this started. When I was given, given over to the Lord, it was in my bedroom. I, 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 I prayed, and I, it was October 6th. And I prayed and I gave myself to the Lord. No one helped me. My, my church didn't believe in the born again experience. They believed in the Reader's Digest. And he would preach out of the Reader's Digest every week. And I, tith I would tithe. I tithe 75 cents a week. Because that's, I I, that's what I made uh, cutting grass. So I've tithed since I was 10 years old. So please don't even tell me what you think about tithing. And unless it's... You know, unless, you know, I want to look at your Bible if you ripped out the whole Old Testament. Because Jesus actually didn't have a New Testament. He was the New Testament. He quoted from the Old Testament. Paul was writing the New Testament. He quoted the Old Testament. Okay, so I had to find out about being born again from someone at work who told me that there was a born again experience. So I went home and I said, I want that. He didn't even pray with me. So I got born again. And after that, I started to have dreams and visions. I mean, like that, just like this. And, and um, I was on the, on, on the hill where I used to go and sit and pray and cry. Because I, all, all my life, all my childhood life, I was beat by my father. So I would just run and, and hide. And I would just go up there on that mountain and just cry. And I wanted God to kill me. I would hold my breath. I would at night I would hold my breath hoping that I wouldn't wake up. But my dad, he 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 died a Christian, a strong Christian who loved me. But I had to stay in there with him and everybody around me was mad because I kept loving him anyway. But he he sat before he died, he sat at a table with us and he looked at my wife and he goes, "I just want you to know I'm a Christian because of this man." I used to tell him, you can hit me again, Dad. I love you. Here, hit this side. I was, I was, I was a bodybuilder. If you look in the old magazines, you can see me. Don't do it, but I mean, <laughs> my wife's hidden all of them, so. Because Speedos were in, you know. But it was ridiculous. I was, I was like this. I was like this guy. I would, I would go to the contest and bring home trophies, and my dad would beat me, and I would let him. Because I loved my dad, and I knew that it was an evil spirit. Okay, but I went up to that mountain, and you're not going to believe what happened. I was 19, just giving my life to the Lord, and Jesus walks right up to me and sits down with me. And he talks to me about my calling. 
And he tells me my future. He tells me about working for an airline. I'm 19. I haven't even gone to college yet. He tells me about working for an airline, and then I'm going to be able to, uh, after I'm, I'm done there, that I, I'm going to have all the money I would ever need. This is what he said. He said, because you're never going to be manipulated in your message by money. You're never going to have to live because of the offerings. People will not be able to manipulate your message by offerings. If they pull back, it doesn't matter. You can throw fruit at me. Whatever you want to do, you can do. But you're going to be held accountable for it. Because I was sent back as a sign and a wonder. So Jesus explained this to me. So everything he said came to pass. He told me about my calling, my five-fold calling uh, that's in, in Ephesians chapter 4. And he told me that people were not going to like me because of my, the anointing and the mantle that's on me. This is at 19. Okay, so you, you, you fast forward to now I'm, I've, I've graduated from my undergraduate, and I'm during that time at that school, I was given a tape to listen to by a man who used to be with that denomination. They said, you might want to hide this, but listen to this. When I listened to the power of God, it was so strong. And when I, I, could, when I listened to it, I could, I could pray in tongues more than 10 minutes at a time. I went to three hours. So I did that for the last two years of my undergraduate. I put that tape in, and I would listen to it, and I could pray in tongues for three hours listening to this man teach on the Holy Spirit. I would be up all night because I was armed security. In those two years of missing, I missed two meals a day for my last two years of college. Only, only ate once a day. Went to class, uh, essentially just put my gun in, my, in the safe and went in my uniform to, co to, to college. And then ha went home and slept a couple hours and then put my gun back on and went back to work again. Did that all the time. I did that for the two years, fasting and praying. And when I, when I was told to go to this other school, the two-year program, I was working at a hotel. And that man walked through the lobby. And when he did, the same power that I felt coming from that tape for those years was now, would now just walk by me. It was the same power. The same, if I shut my eyes, it was just like listening. To, but I didn't know this person. And I was told to stay away from them. But they also had Smith Wigglesworth books at, in the library at this place. So, till, you know. So, the manager comes up and he goes, uh, this guy wants you to take him up to his room. I'm like, and um, so I took him up and I met his wife and then his little Jessica, his little baby, little baby just born, Jessica, Suzanne, and Benny Hinn. He said, I want you to meet my wife. I want you to meet my little daughter. And he said, God's got a plan for you. And I just said goodbye to him. So the next day he comes down. He's going over because he's doing, he's doing services across the street in Tulsa. Yongi Cho's there, and he's speaking that night. And uh, I say to him, I said, hey, if if you, if, if you are released by the Holy Spirit to talk to me, I would really like to talk to you about something that happened to me. And I was going to tell him about what's going on. And um, he goes, well, I don't do that. He goes, you got a pastor? I go, yeah. It's Kenneth Hagin Jr. He goes, oh. He goes, well, he goes, you talk to him. I go, he doesn't talk to people. He says, well, I can't do it. Walks into the elevator. Comes back out, he's mad. He goes, the Lord told me I have to talk to you. <laughs> so he says, he says, you be here at seven tomorrow night or forget it. So I'm there and he's late. So he sits down and he starts to prophesy to me. It went on for 40 minutes. The impartation went into me, but it was the same thing as the tape. Now, I don't agree with everything that's going on. I actually don't agree with a lot of things that are going on right now with anybody. 
but I'm not going to speak against them. I'm just not going to be like that. See, if you get offended, you become like them. That's what Jesse told me. He said, you can hurt me, but you can't offend me. He says, because if you offend me, I become like you. And I don't want to be like you. If you, if you bring offense in, then, then um, you're an instrument of Satan. If it's wrong. If, if you offend people because of the gospel's sake, well, then they need to be offended because they need to, they need to turn. Okay, so this is what happened. He spoke to me and he said, he said, I have no idea what's going on here. I go, I do, but I never told him anything. He said, I'm supposed to give you everything I have, all my tapes, everything. And he said, the Lord told me you're going to have my ministry. He said, I've been waiting years to do this. Lays hands on me and I never see him again, ever. That was in 1986. Fast forward. The Lord tells us to go to New Orleans. So we actually just rent a hotel every month for a week and pray in tongues, me and my wife, right? We rented a car, fasted, didn't eat, one week. Now we're working, we're working, both have careers, full time. We both, we have two houses. Don't get mad, I wasn't in the ministry. We had two houses, one in Seattle, they were both given to us. We had one in Phoenix. And what I meant by that is that somebody paid them off because the Lord told them to, so don't get mad at me. We had two houses paid off. We lived in Seattle. We lived in Phoenix. You want to know why? Because I don't go after money. It goes after me because I'm going to put it to work. So we sold both of those houses, and, and we went to New Orleans, but we fasted and prayed. From, at different times of the month, every month, we would go down there. And one day, the Lord told us to take a tour of Jesse to plan us ministries. Well, he's one of those prosperity guys, you know. But see, the thing that is, is just like with Benny Hinn, it wasn't about what you think. It was about the handoff. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. So when Jesus spoke to me on the mountain and he said, this is what you're called to do, that's in stone. Now, from then on, even if people mess up along the way, I still get the benefit of what they were walking in. So Jesse, I mean, he's nothing like what you think. I mean, I've watched him just this last year pay three people's houses off in our church. Everybody wants to come to our church. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. He, he invests, he, he prays in tongues, invests his money. And that's where he gets his money, not from offerings. He puts that into the ministry. So everybody's upset about everything, but the thing of it is, is this guy's actually just a businessman that's an evangelist. Yeah. 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 And he's actually uh, actually prophetic, too. He tells me stuff, that, and Kathy stuff, that happens like two or three months later. He gives me exact, exact data. This is going to happen, and it does. But you, you wouldn't even know that. You think he's just funny. Okay, so he he is there that day when we do that. So we're doing that 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 tour. He comes out of his office and he shakes my hand. And when he does, he can't let go of it. He just holds it. And I look into his eyes. It's like we've known each other forever. And that's when the Lord spoke to him. So the next thing you know, I'm on TBN. Next thing you know, we're being ordained by him. Now, he just, a couple weeks ago, he just came to our studios and did a show with us at... He was our guest, him and Kathy. You can't make this stuff up. So getting back to Keith Ellis and the office, he prophesies we need offices. Jesse prophesied these offices. You know what happened? The Lord said, you're going to have 12 storehouse lane. Well, that's Jesse's old office. I told Jesse, I, I said, okay, Jesse, I'm going to have 12 storehouse lane. It came out of my mouth. I don't need an office at the time. 
Keith calls me. He says, in two weeks, you're going to have an office, full studio, TV studios, warehouse, everything. He said, and you're about to get huge. Two weeks later, we signed for 12 Storehouse Lane. Now we have enough sets there to do 15 different shows, different sets with cameras, all paid for. So I'm just going to take over Facebook and YouTube. I'm going to take over. We started our own network. Okay, this is, as, this is as someone who just had a career. Me and Kathy had a career, and we were told by the Lord to do something. So the impartation here is sickness is not going to stop you. God is going to tell you to stop, not sickness. You're not going to end. In other words, you, when you die, you die because it's your time. You don't die because of some sickness. Now, that's the perfect will of God. Now, I don't want you, if, if I ever die of a sickness, I don't want you to even weep for me. But I want to tell you right now, it was not God's fault. If you hear that I die of something, just so you know, it was, I messed up, not God. You won't hear anybody else say this, but I'm, that's how much I believe in the healer. If, if you have a phone that is, is putting out a hot spot, uh, could you turn that off? It's messing with our live feed. And uh, uh, maybe even shut, if you have Wi-Fi on, shut that off as well. Don't. Unconnect to the Wi-Fi and shut off your hotspots if you would. Is that correct? Sorry about that. No, though, we're good. I could do this in a hailstorm upside down. <laughs> do you have another one? <laughs> okay. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. We've had people come to us and leave us $1.4 million because the Lord told them to. So don't, please don't, don't even approach me about prosperity and about healing and about all the benefits of how many souls I can get saved. I'm going to get a billion souls. One billion, one seventh of the earth. If I have to do it on a bicycle, I'll do it but I don't have to. When, when are you going to lip it up and let the Lord speak to you and take the limitations off? Because I'm telling you what, if you had spent one day in your mansion up there, you wouldn't want to come back. Why would you? But then this is going to become a Walmart with no doors. You're going to go into Walmart and you can never leave. That's how I feel about this earth. It's, it's a trap. It's like being in Walmart all day and never leaving. And at 6 a.m., I got you, babe, starts playing on the, on the radio. And you start it all over again. And the groundhog sees his shadow again. I got you, babe. As you cross the street, there's Uncle Harry. You just knock him out, just like you did. You, you take, you, you, it's rigged. He takes the groundhog and runs over a cliff. See, he learns how to play the game within the game, but the game is that this is a fallen world and we were never made to operate in a fallen world. If you don't mind me, keep telling stories, I will. Okay, when I was, when I was training, flight training, I did all that with that captain. We did it nine months. I learned how to fly and it was really cool. I got to fly with, I mean, I don't know if you know who Kirby Chambliss is, but he is the aerobatic champion of the world but he's also a pilot for Southwest Airlines. When I was learning to fly and then I got all my ratings, he one day, he said, well, can you come out and film me because I need to do a promo for Red Bull? Because, you know, he, he I don't know if you know, but he became like the, the pilot for Red Bull and um, of all the, he was the airbag champion. Okay, but he asked me, he said, Could, you know, can we go down? You can fly with me uh, in your plane and then I want you to lay on the runway and I'm gonna come over you upside down and I want you to just flip some uh, photos of me and, you know, do some shots of me coming, you know, sideways and doing my thing, you know. <laughs> so here I am. I'm, I'm flying in formation 
with 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 this guy who w- would someday become just like with Israel Houghton and all these other people, Eddie James, all these precious people. But here I am. He's flying in formation, and he says, "Oh, you can lead." So he's flying in formation. We go down to this area, this other airport, in in um like near Pinal County in 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 Arizona, and we land, and then. I do the, the thing, he does all his, his, his gig, you know, his thing, he's just doing all these wild stuff, you know? And then we fly back. And then um, we're talking on the radio to each other and he goes, well, what do you, you, when we land, do you wanna go eat? And he goes, yeah. I go, do you wanna go to the uh, fair, the state fair? Um, they have these, um, they have this really cool ride that I wanted to try. And he goes, no, that's dangerous. <laughs> I go, what? See, he says, no, he says, what, what I'm doing is predictable because I'm practicing all the time. He said, this is predictable. So he starts real high and then he starts bringing it down. And then when he does his air shows, it looks like, you know, there's no margin for error, but it's predictable because he's become accustomed to it. And so I, when I, when I went later, I was asked by a a girl that I was training to be a flight attendant who was actually an officer in the Air Force. Her husband is now a general. He was a lieutenant colonel at the time. And he was the head over the F-16 squadron at Luke Air Force Base before 9-11. And I was training her, and she goes, why are you even here? I go, I don't know. She goes, you you know, I said, I was going to be an aerospace engineer, and, you know, I wanted to fly F-16s. And she goes, you're kidding. And I go... No, she, she she goes, one second. She goes back to the back, gets on her phone. She calls her husband. She, it was flip phones at the time. So she flips her phone and she comes up and she goes, you're going to get your dream. I go, what is that? She goes, you're going to get, you're going to get trained in the F-16. My husband said he'll take you on this weekend. It'll be just an abbreviated thing. But he said, uh, I can get you in. So I went through all this training Friday and then Saturday we showed up at the simulator and I flew against him and it, it's, it's so real that the FAA allows you to log it as real time. And um, I flew against him and he has the most hours in the F-16. He flew for the Thunderbirds and then he, um, he became the squadron commander out there. Now it's the F-35 because that's the new airplane. And he trained me on all that and all the buttons and everything. And I, I knew how to fly, uh, you know, smaller airplanes. But when I got into that airplane and I did everything that I had learned, the, the performance on the airplane was so much greater and take me, it, take me further than what I was accustomed to. But see, that existed the whole time. The, that was actually available all the time, but I didn't know about it. I, I heard about it, but I didn't know about it. So you hear about Jesus and you hear about miracles and you hear about uh, things where God intervenes in people's lives. But knowing it is when you experience it. So I really am one of those people that there's, there can be so much teaching and not enough experiential knowledge. You have to have experiential knowledge. It has to be implemented in your life. And everything that I say, it has to be it has to be applicable to you or else I'm just setting myself up so that you can like, you know, and then what I do is I make you a repeat customer. Well, you got to come back to my next one because I'm going to have another study guide. And, you, and the whole thing is, is that, is that it gets to where it's corporate, where you need me because I'm the apostle or I'm the prophet. But see, Jesus wasn't like that. He was trying to work his way out of that by imparting it to the disciples. You got it? Okay, so that's the way it's supposed to be. So the impartation that's on me and my wife is is if God can speak to people to pay off our houses and to to give us millions, why can't he do it for you? No, I'm serious. You think, what is he talking about? Well, what are you talking about? You're still thinking about your scrambled eggs. Yeah, you haven't even gotten over breakfast yet. And where are you going to eat for lunch? And I'm talking about eternal things. How do you want to finish this life? How do you want to finish? Because you can't finish what God has for you unless he gives you provision for your vision, which means that you are healed, which means that you are financially secure. It's, it's, not, it's not so you can be greedy. 
dear Lord, it cost me $1,000 just to come to this, this meeting this morning. What are you talking about? You know what I'm saying. I mean, you know what I'm saying. You can't hold on to that stuff. You wait, you wait and you hear what happens to me. Don't be mad. But, but this is good seed. All right. Okay, so th here's the thing before we go. I'm going to go till 1215 because th th instead of 12, I'm going to give it another a half hour from right now. All right. Now, now, during that time, you, you're looking at someone who doesn't think about money, doesn't have to worry about money and work very hard. But we don't even think about money. Why? It's because God is our provision. We've inherited him. It doesn't have to do with money. See, when I get him, I get healing which might cost me $60,000 a month with a doctor, or he could just heal me. Well, that's prosperity. Right? The Spirit of the Lord told me he, told, he chose the house we were supposed to, to live in. It's three, it's three feet higher than all the other houses, so it can never flood there. But I, I didn't know that. I, could, I saw, so then the, the owner, the doctor that we bought the house from down there, he showed me pictures of the Air National Guard coming down in boats down our street. Everybody is underwater except our, our property. He said, this is what you're buying. You have an island here. It was amazing. See, God knew that. And I, so I looked it up when the house was built. Are you ready for this? I don't know if you are. When the Lord told me, when I left Rama Bible Training Center, and, he, and I was ready to stay and be a singer with Kenneth, Kenneth Hagan, and the Lord said, you're not going to do that. You're going to Southwest Airlines. He told me that in 1986. In 1986, that house was being built. Wow. Yeah. That I live in, right, what we live in right now. Now listen to me. In 1986, what was happening? In 1986, I fell asleep. It was in my second year of Rama. I fell asleep at the pool. And I had a dream of walking up to a Southwest Airlines airplane. And the pilot opened the window and he peeked his head out. He goes, I hear you're coming to work for us. And in the dream, I said, yeah, I'll be there in two years. He said, okay, we'll see you then. And I woke up. I'm like, not <laughs> did you know i got hired in july exactly to the month july of 88 the, the pilot that was in the dream is the guy who actually i met and got me the job he got me the job i don't think you heard me because there'd be dancing and tambourines and stuff right now the same guy in the dream that told me is the guy that walked up to the podium and said, you need to work for Southwest Airlines. And I said, well, you know, and he goes, you know what? Put your application in and I'll take it. I know the lady. And the Lord said, do it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so I, the next day I got a call and was hired through a process, you know. But I tell you this because when I retired from Southwest Airlines, all the friends that I had made, all the pilots I'd made friends with, and all the flight attendants, they, I got them to sign uh, pictures of them with their jet or whatever they flew, because all those guys at Southwest flew airplanes that were amazing. They were space shuttle pilots. There were some that were uh, experimental air airplanes, one-of-a-kind airplanes. So I would find photos, and I'd get them to sign, and I have that in my office. They're just all over the place. There's photos in my, at my house of signed photos of one of a kind airplanes from all these guys. But the one guy he signed, he's a Thunderbird pilot, but he didn't send me a picture of him with his Thunderbird jet. He sent me a picture of a Southwest Airlines jet and he's hanging out the other side of the window waving bye to me. To get it? So in the dream, the pilot was on the other side and he was bidding me to come to him and I have that photo. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus, now that I've, I've got your faith up, this is, this, is, this is what I want to talk about. Jesus is your substitute for your sin and your sickness. 
and we'll get into this tonight again, but I want to get into as, as fast as I can while the bandwidth is up. <laughs> okay, this is so powerful, this scripture, that the Hebrew people in their synagogues, they're not allowed to read Isaiah 53 anymore. Did you know that? Because people were, when it's being read, people are saying, that's talking about Jesus. So they, they, you can't read it. It's, did you know that? They skip over it now. Because there's, there's conversions. Well, no, when you read it, when you read it, when you read it, it's like, oh my God, this is a, this is a prophecy about Jesus. Okay, so this is the, this is the substitute part of it. it once, if you can grasp this, there will be so many of you healed immediately. He who has believed and trusted and relied and adhered to our message of salvation and to whom, if not us, has the arm and infinite power of the Lord been revealed. This is the amplified version of 53 of Isaiah. For he, the servant of God, grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root uh, out of the dry ground. He has no stately form or majestic splendor that we would look at him nor handsome appearance that we would be attracted to him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and pain and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not appreciate his worth or esteem him. But in fact, he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows and pains, yet we ignorantly assumed that he was stricken and struck down by God and degraded and humili humiliated by him. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Okay, I'm going to stop there. When I was shown what Jesus had went through, I realized that it would be really silly not to accept healing or forgiveness. Okay, so I'm going to focus on these two things before we, we break for lunch. Number one is, either you're forgiven or you're not. There is no gray area. But forgiveness is not based on feeling. This is the biggest problem that I face in my spirit schools and with my students is getting them out of sin consciousness. Okay, so the Catholic Church and, and denominations like that, they keep people at bay by keeping them guilty. So they, 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 they have to control. So the Pharisees lost control. Because Jesus was saying, now he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No, this is really, you know, the, the Pharisees' gig was being messed up. So, so that's what happens. If, if, if a minister comes and, and gives to your building project and gives away free books, say, if you don't have money, don't worry about it. Just come. I mean, in my spirit schools, we even buy you a meal. I, me, me and Kathy pay for it. We give away a manual. My partners pay for that. So Jesus flipped the tables. He did the, the thing that was keeping people from being free. So what did he say? He said, you're key, you put yokes on people when you're supposed to be taking them off, right? Yeah. Okay, so why have you not received your healing? It might be one of two things. It might be that you still don't receive forgiveness because Jesus said, what's harder? Say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. Remember? It's going to take you at least a hundred years to get the whole revelation of that. But Jesus was speaking from the other realm. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. <laughs> he was already slain. 
Well, part of that being slain was your healing. Not only that, your mental torment. Any kind of bondage that you have, you know what? You don't have to feel bad anymore. You just need to be free. So you enter in because you're accepted. The Lord loves you. When I was with him, he has love that is, is not revealed on this earth. It's impossible for us to grasp all of his love here. We can only see it through the demonstration of God's son. But, but when I was in heaven, there was, there was things that I was told I would never be able to speak. There was things I would never be able to write. There were things that I cannot interpret. I cannot tell you because there's no words for it. Our language doesn't have enough words or vowels or, or there's not enough instrument. In fact, my, my, my album doesn't have words, but it got charted with billboard. Okay, so this last one, the Lord told me I can sing on it a little bit. But see, my music is supposed to be so that you can meditate and pray and read the Bible. So it doesn't, I don't want it to take away, but it's, so it's, it's instrumental. But, you know, I'm a voice major. That's something I can do. I can sing, but I can't play these instruments. So this last one, I asked three o'clock session. The Lord told me to have three o'clock session. It's a family, father, son, and mother. And, and you'll see them with me at times. They're going to be with us at Lost Stand here, you know, next, next month, right? Dear Lord, it's fast. Okay, the Lord said you can have them on the album because they're clean before me and um, they, they won't hold you back. So I called them. They said, we'd be honored. We can't even believe it. I said, well, this doesn't happen, but uh, I'm going to fly you in. They end up driving. They, they want to fly. But I, I said, you know, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to pay you. I said, you're going to sit here. I'm going to give you the key and um, the chord progression. You just follow me for an hour and a half. And then we're going to do a post production and send it to New York to be, to be mastered and, and produced. They go, that's it. I go, that's it. It's going to be a capture of the environment of heaven. Okay. So we did that live. We, we narrowed it down to like 50 minutes from an hour and a half. I put it out. It went out on Amazon on Monday by Wednesday. It was, it was number four under Laura Dangle. Bestseller. So I pulled it off. Because I wanted Sid to launch it. Okay, now when I listen to my own album, it captures me up into that place. And I, and I did it, but I didn't do it. You get it? It's the same way. I, I listened to my message for an hour last night. I listened to it before I came out here. Why? Because something that happened last night, I wanted in that because that didn't come from me. I experienced something by watching my own video. I do that all the time. I go home. As soon as I go home, I get ushered out. I go right to my bed. I lay down and I watch, I watch it to capture what God was doing in the service because I don't remember everything that I do. Okay, this is the kind of life that Jesus bought for you. He's your substitute. He's your perfect substitute. So because he took your place, now he says, you're going to take my place on the earth. You're going to be like me in this earth. He said, as I was, you're going to be. He said, you're going to do these works and even greater. How could he say that? Well, he did it to the disciples. They did more when he was away from them because the spirit came. Okay, so the Without, without uh, continuing on with this, if I, if I want to come back to this tonight, I will. But here it is. God's will is to heal everyone because God invested everything in Jesus to buy back everything. Now, I know that. That is the truth. But in practicality down here, it's a war. It's a real war. And you have to learn how to administer the other realm into this realm. This is, should not be uncharted territory, but it is. Okay, so to explain this to you, why God did this for me and not for you, is because he just wanted it to be a sign and a wonder to help you along the way. It's not to exalt me. 
because I won't let it happen. If if you guys if you guys if you guys would would follow me to the point where the Lord would be grieved, I would disappear. Because I will I will I will step back. I almost did it in January because people are starting to look to me. But the Lord said, you can manage this right. You start to build people up to where they can carry warrior notes. And they can do this. So this is, this is what I want to, want to talk about before we go. We've got 15 minutes. Um, the process, the process of entering into what it is that God has for you, it's a process of discovery. But see, if you seek after something, it will evade you. But if you seek after him, you'll get it all. Now, this is what I know because I was on the other side. Okay, so this is what happens. When I pray in the Spirit, okay, I'll start with this. Every time I've ever ministered, like right now, like right this moment as I'm standing here, you have no idea what's really happening behind the scenes. There's a very large angel behind me. He's on fire. Jesus is right here. Now, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's not, it's not for your benefit. Because the scripture says that where there are two or more gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. So that's all you need. But see, your mind can't frame those dimensions because it clashes with what you know. So you can't imagine that there's more dimensions that, that aren't colliding with this dimension. They're, they're parallel and they're higher. So Jesus can be standing right here. Not... Not only that, this is what's going to flip you out, is that every time I've ever spoke, the Lord comes and stands right there. The operating table is right here. It's, it's right here, starts right here, goes right to here. My body is right there. Jesus is right here where he left me when he told me to go back to my body. Surgeon, assistant, anesthesiologist, right there. Every time I speak, I'm back in that room. Nothing has, nothing has transpired in the spirit because it's I am. Jesus is with me, so it's I am. It's a place. <laughs> it's a center of everything. When Jesus shows up, you're in the middle of his, his will, whether you like it or not, you just became in the perfect will of God. When God sends angels to you, congratulations, you're in the perfect will of God. All of a sudden, it happens because he invades your dimensions and takes them over. It's called an encounter. But you can walk in this even when you don't feel anything. Like right now, I, wa I want to rest. But right now, I am standing where Jesus sent me back to my body. And when I pray in tongues, I go to the future, sometimes a couple minutes ahead, sometimes years ahead. When I pray in the spirit, I have flashes. And so, for instance, the contractor that's doing our studios, he, he offered to take us to the airport because we had a lot of bags, because we had to do multiple things on this trip. So Kathy is standing right here. I'm here, and Bobby's right here. And he said, well, do you want me to just get another vehicle because it's going to rain tomorrow? And, uh, you know, I have a pickup truck. I go, as soon as he said that, I was taken to the next day at 8.15 in the morning, and it wasn't raining. So all of a sudden I looked at him, I come back and I said, it's not going to rain anymore. You can bring your truck. He goes, well, the man of God has spoken. So he gets out of his truck at 815, you know, the, that morning he goes, no rain, just like the man of God said. I said, well, what? Is, and I thought to myself, well, what is it that makes you a man of God or a woman of God? You know, like, like people say that, that like, that's to me, that's natural. But it used to be like, whoa, if I could just be like that. But I didn't chase after that. That became a normal thing for me because I'm walking with him. And I'm telling you, you could, you could skip over a bunch of stuff if you would just relax in your relationship with him and know that really, you know, 
you're going to live forever in heaven. You just need to obey the voice of the Lord and, and give the devil a headache while you're here. I mean, it, and, and you'll come down with a healing as you're doing it. And your provision will come. See, some of you are getting your feeling it. I'm going to walk a little closer to y'all. There's, there's, a, there's a standard in heaven that's absolute. And God has already spoken. Now, wh why was it that I spent 29 years in an airline and the Lord told me that at 19 years old when I was just finishing high school? And I didn't even want to go to an airline unless it was going to be a pilot. But I ended up staying for 29 years, just like he said. And when I retired, I had enough money for me and my wife to do our own thing and not depend upon income from a ministry. So everything can go to warrior notes. Okay, now that that's happened, it's kind of fun that in December, I'm going to be able to start taking my retirement. It's going to be really fun because that's seed. I don't know if you get this. I don't need that. But someone else does. But how do you get like that? I'll tell you how you get like that. When you're standing there and you know that the Lord sent you back from the dead and you, your next breath is a gift. If you will get to this place, then healing is not going to evade you. It's going to come to you. One of the people that I was sent back for was the president of our company. They ended up being on my airplane right before I retired. They, they you know, and they, they all knew who I was because I had received awards from, from the president for just being a good Christian. They, they think you're a great employee just because you, you know, you, you actually show up for work and you're, you're nice, you know. <laughs> And, and you, you're a problem solver instead of a problem maker. Yeah, and you should see the plaque I got, this big, large check behind it from the president. And I'm like, this is just like the, the fruit of the spirit listed in Galatians, you know, or whatever, you know. So they knew who I was. So I, I said, hey, she said hi to me. Um, Herb Kelleher was the CEO. She was the president, Colleen. And Herb would remember my name. He, he, he would help me at work. He wouldn't sit in his seat, sign autographs. He would be up there helping me. He was throwing bags down there when we get to the to gate, asking the employees, you know, what can we do to make your job better? He, he loved people. You know, those days seem to be over, but I miss those days. So with her, I was sent back for her. So on the way out, she hugged me, and I whispered in her, and I said, I just want you to know, that when I died on the operating table, Jesus told me that you were part of history, that he chose you to help form Southwest Airlines, to provide people with a safe place to work and to prosper. She started shaking and crying. She goes, you have no idea what you just said. I go, I know, but the <laughs> Lord, I said, I know, but the Lord loves you. And you are part of something huge. And you, there are so many people that will thank you for what you've done. And she had, to be, she had to be practically carried off. She was sobbing. She was shaking. Never saw her again. Never saw Herb again. But see, I was an integral part of a piece of a puzzle. You get it? So, so God inserts you into situations and the Spirit of God will cause you to see ahead of time, give you wisdom, it's called. He gives you knowledge, but he gives you understanding. So Jesus was all about understanding. When he was with me, he would constantly, he would inquire if I'm, I'm grasping it because he said it's what you understand, it's not what you hear. See, I was told, you know, because they quote the scripture, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But really, it comes by understanding. Yeah. Because it, that, 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 changed, that changed doctrine, if you notice. Then it went to, if I say it enough, God will just give it to me because he's going to get tired of hearing from me. 
I don't know if you get what I just said, but this is not the father relationship that Jesus bought for us. I don't know if you're all getting this or not, are you? Okay, so faith is actually, I trust God because he trusts me. He loved me first, so he trusts me first. And because he loved me, I love him. His goodness led me to repentance. That's what Paul said. So I don't preach hell. Most people know they're going there. I tell them about a good God who has a book that's written about them, and he doesn't want you to go to hell. I said, because he's got all these good plans for you, and you count. You're valued. You're safe in him. And they start crying every time. I've never had anybody turn me down. I've had religious people turn me down, but I've never had anybody at work. For all those years I witnessed to people, I didn't have anybody turn me down. They all started crying. Men and women, pilots alike. So your destiny is what you should be focusing on. And that's Jesus. Jesus has written a book that is is specifically for you. It doesn't happen because you haven't engaged him on that level. Your healing is going to come. Your prosperity is going to come. You know, for me, it's going to be the souls, a billion souls. Oh, yeah. I don't mind telling you, I got plans because he's got plans. But it, it, is, it is beyond. I've had flashes of the future, so I'm just doing it. I don't mind telling you. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sneak peek of what's going to happen this year. Well, you know, my school's going to go to 17,000. So it's going to double. And, and um, then we're going to start a whole bunch of other things. We're going to start a school of music. We're going to start a school of prayer and a school of healing. So we're going to do, we're going to train people to be healing technicians, to, to heal like John G. Lake had. Yeah. And then we're going to also train people to be prayer warriors to, to help the, with the church's prayer. So I'm going to teach people how to be the prayer, the healing technician for their, 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 their church so that they can go in and set it up so where people can come and get prayed for. They get the word of God taught to them every day. We're going to do it from our studios live for a while, but then I want to get all the churches to be involved. We're going to do music school. I'm going to bring in the best musicians that are anointed of God, and they're going to teach classes on their instrument or whatever they're going to do, and we're going to show you how to flow and and write songs because there's so many songs in heaven that need to be written. Okay, this is one, this one. I bought the domain. It it, it was still there, Jets for Jesus. And I'm going to minister to pilots. So we're going to have... We're going to have a show where all my pilot friends are going to be on. They're going to talk about God. But they're also, we have, a, we have right now it's being built, a, a fully, a fully uh, operative simulator, jet simulator, that, that's going to be used to train. And we're going to train people how to, to do their ground school and to fly. We're going to have shows like that, but we're going to have it like Mr. Rogers, where I just show up to the plane, take my jacket off, I'm going to sit and talk, and we're going to go fly somewhere, fully, sim, fully sim, simulation. And then when we land, I'm going to get my jacket back on and put my slippers off. And I'm going to go. Why? Because Jesus told me to minister to people. He told me to minister to children. So we're going to have kids. They're going to come and learn how to fly on our show. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on our, our, our network. The reason why is, is someone has to think out of the box because that's where Jesus is. Jesus was never in the box. So I'm going to get all the kids saved. I'm going to get the pilots saved. I, and I'll tell you what, 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 how this happened. When I, was, when I was at work, I could fly the plane that I was on, but I, I served drinks for 29 years. But when I would go up there, the pilots, they, they would, after a while they heard, because the flight attendants, I would minister to them, and they would get saved, and then they would go up and tell the pilots. He said, you know, Kevin died and came back. You know, he w- went in for surgery. And um, they go, when did this happen? He goes, oh, you know, so he goes, tell him to get up here. So I go up there and I'm like telling him. And the pilot starts crying. I look and the first officer's crying. So the captain goes, I got the airplane. You need to talk to him. So the first officer turned around. He's bawling. He goes, Kevin, while you were talking, he said, I, he said while you were talking, he said everything disappeared and I was back in the woods at 16 years old and someone had accidentally shot a deer arrow at me 
and it was going for the back of my head and I heard my name being called, but none of my, the, my, my hunter friends w called my name because it was so fast, but I turned around and I caught the arrow. He said, I don't know how I caught the arrow because even if you tell somebody to do it, you know, it's coming, you can't catch it. But he turned the whole way around 180 degrees and, and he said, my arm went up and I grabbed it and it just nicked and he, he showed me the scar. It's like a you know, four point scar right here. He said, as you were talking about Jesus and how we all have a book and, and you were sent back, he said, Jesus appeared to me and he said, I saved your life this, and sent you this man. Accept me now. He accepted the Lord right there at 35,000 feet. Never saw him again. But see, do you understand? If, if we start to build a network where we have a school, where we disciple people, we go out, our teams, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to do things like this, but we're going to be, we have to go to convention centers, but we're going to send a crew in. We've already got them designated. They will go in a day early and go out and evangelize in the town and hand out flyers. And then my first night, I will share my testimony and give an altar call and get people saved. Then I'll do my spirit school for the rest of the weekend. That's coming. So we're going to start putting out the net and, and bringing people to the Lord. This move of God is going to get big. So with that, with that, the things that I've, I've seen in the marketplace where I, I didn't have a, a, a collar on, I wasn't a minister, but I was a minister. I could pray in tongues. I could read my Bible. And when I did, I would get words from my crew members. And I would go the next day and they said, what did you do last night? And I go, well, I was praying for you. And they said, they, they said Man, that touches me. I go, yeah, the Lord's talking to me about your daughter. And um, she's, she's destined to be an artist. And sh she, needs, she needs to go to school and, 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 and develop her gift. She starts crying. She goes, that's why I'm doing this trip. I'm picking up extra money so I can pay for her school. Sometimes I've known their daughter's name. One time at a restaurant filming for Sid Roth at the restaurant hotel. The other minister goes, hey, this guy, you got to hear his testimony. He's been to heaven. She goes, really? And I, he goes, hey, tell her something from the Lord. I'm like, thanks a lot. You know, I, <laughs> I said, well, what's this about your daughter, Destiny? She goes, well, she starts crying. She goes, well, I'm believing for a husband, but when I get married, I've already told the Lord I'm going to name my daughter Destiny. <laughs> See, God was already talking about her daughter, and she's believing for a husband. Are you getting it? I don't know if you're getting it. It's, it's all forward looking in this realm, but in that realm, it's now. So how many of you, as we leave here, how many of you can see yourself healed? Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Because I see myself healed, even if I limp out of here. I see myself healed because I want to participate in what was done a long time ago for me, but also I can see in the future, just like with my eyes and my kidneys, that I'm healed. Yeah. That it's part of an implementation of the other realm's truth, absolute truth, into this realm. So it wouldn't be surprised if you come back here and this building's four times as big. Because it's meant to be. If not, they go to a different location. But it's already meant to be. Why? Because many people, like, I, 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 I'm being honest with you. If you knew how rigged this was, if you could see how rigged this thing is, you would just get over yourself. But you have to hook up with God. And what it is, is, is you have to get over the fear of death. You have to get over your sin consciousness. You have to let Jesus fully take your place. And and I, 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 I risk, I risk I, taking two more minutes. I'm telling you this. When I looked into Jesus' eyes, he wanted me to tell you this before I leave. He, he wanted me to tell you this right now. He said, tell them about my eyes. Because when I looked into his eyes, he was talking to me, and you've heard me say this before, about the millennial reign. And he was saying that there will be a thousand years that I'm actually down here, he said, you're you're actually qualifying, you're on probation for your next job. 
And he said, while my people are down here surviving, you're down here thriving and qualifying for your next position with me. He said, you're going to rule and reign with me shoulder to shoulder forever. He said, so be faithful to learn everything you're supposed to learn down here. I was so surprised. I, I thought, you know, so, you know, I had to stop, you know, like Perry Stone is like one of my favorite teachers. And so is Andrew Womack. And, you know, like we watch Perry Stone every day when we eat dinner, you know, wherever we're at, we just bring up on the phone. But if he starts talking about the Antichrist and the Red Dragon, I have to turn it off personally because I, I could get too much of that. And then all of a sudden I'm like wanting to hole up somewhere. You get in that mentality. I mean, there's got to be a balance. Like he's doing it to educate us so that when things start happening, we understand that he's doing his job. The only thing is, is that when I was with Jesus, I saw that I was forgiven and that he didn't know my past, which to me wasn't as bad as some, but because I was religious, I was going to hell because I was good. I really, I really, the, the rich young ruler. I mean, you, are you going to tell Jesus that you've, you've obeyed all the laws since birth? Been perfect? He did. He told him that. And Jesus goes, oh, you just lack one small thing. Just sell everything you have. Give the money to my ministry. No, he said, give it to the poor. And come and follow me and you'll have great, you'll have great rewards in heaven. Well, he couldn't do it. Why? Because he had great wealth. Well, that was what he served. And that was his comfort. And, and everyone that is a disciple has to leave everything. So everybody leaves everything and then they get everything back because it says that Jesus said, if you leave houses and family and, and anything for my sake, you in this life will receive a hundredfold and persecutions as well. So that's why I get persecuted because I didn't come here in a bicycle. No, think about it. I do. The only reason I'm not sick right now is not my faith. It's because of his goodness. The only reason I'm back alive again is because his goodness. The only way that I can help you is to tell him, tell you about his goodness. But the first thing I saw in his eyes was that he did not have any account of my past. It's gone. There's no file cabinet. You have to accept that right now. Everybody bow your head. Father, I just ask right now that you would give the grace, the ability for everyone in this room to receive your forgiveness. <sighs> Thank you, Father, for the mercy flowing in this room right now. And the Lord says by his spirit, you are forgiven. And your sins are gone. As the east is from the west, it's gone. You have been cleansed by my blood. You've been made whole by the blood of Jesus. The Lord pronounces you forgiven of your past sins. Let that sink in. Say, I am forgiven. Thank you, Father, Thank you, God. through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. That, I've been that I've been bought with a price. With a price. My life is not my own. <laughs> I live by faith in the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I received, I received a healing this morning. And I've, I've, I, I'm telling you, There's coming a day very soon. I saw that people were waiting out, like, like with this conference, if we would have had everybody come that wanted to come, there'd be a line waiting. Well, I saw that years ago. I saw that people wanted to get in because they were getting healed. They were unsaved people. So that's how this harvest that I'm believing for is going to come in, is that God will start to heal people, and then they'll get saved because they were unsaved people. The Lord took me, and I stood in line. And I heard people talking and they said, yeah, we heard if you get in there, if you can get in there, you'll be healed. 
And um, they, another person said, yeah, even if you sit in the back row, you, you'll even hear God talking to you. That's what they said. I, I, I heard these, the, the, there was massive amounts of people lined up wanting to get into churches because God had started visiting the churches and affecting the whole community. And then what happened was, are you ready for this? I saw that key members in, in the uh, governments for local and state, and then, and then federal eventually, they would come and they would get healed. And then that would start to permeate at a whole nother level that God was going to use that, that God was going to use healing in the last days. So this is very special to me because I've been waiting for this day to, to launch about teaching about healing because I knew that I knew that we had strayed because of the onslaught. You know, like it's, it's hard to believe God when you're just trying to stay alive. I mean, my wife is like tell, calling me back from the dead. My heart would stop and it doesn't do that anymore, but it was an adjustment I had to make because I didn't want to be here and I had to lip it up. And as soon as, right, as soon as I made that adjustment, I haven't had any more problem. And then they did all the heart scans and they found nothing wrong. Okay, so the adjustment's been made here this morning and you're forgiven. But also you have to see Jesus as your substitution. And think about the dreams that I told you about my future being shown to me. It happened just like I was shown. Now, not every dream is of God, but your spirit is trying to communicate with your soul. And you have to give it good, good foundation of the word to help you interpret what's going on. So the more that you meditate on the word of God, the more that you're going to start to flow. Now, what's interesting to me is the devils are not withstanding me here. So that is a compliment to you. Usually I'll have drive-bys and <laughs> visitations, you know by big dark hooded creatures that are like mad that I'm here, but they've opted out. No, I mean it. It's because, it's because of the pastor and because of you all, you all, they, they've opted out. They've opted out. I'm, t I'm not, I, you know, I don't say this all the time. It's usually the other way around. Usually I'm having to pray in tongues just to go to a prayer meeting. I mean, it's pretty bad when you got to pray for two hours just to go to a prayer meeting. Oh, Jesus. Here it goes. Here it goes. You feel that? What is that? Oh, oh Lord, I was wanting to, to quit. Drink it in. Drink him in. The Lord says, you're well able. You're well able to complete everything that I've written about you. I'm going to start to visit you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to reveal to you the great things that I have through you, through Jesus Christ. The Father says, I am with you in a mighty way. The books are open. All over the world. Receive the Holy Spirit right now. All over the world, hundreds of countries are logged on. Thousands of people watching right now. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive this, this last move of God. Receive your inheritance. Receive your assignment. Accept it. Be faithful. You can do this. Fire. Fire. The fire from the altar. Holy fire from the altar right now. The spirit of prophecy in this place. The spirit of prophecy in this place. Jesus reigns supreme. We give you this service. Right now. Impartation. Oh yeah, deliverance. Healing. Healing, Rafa. Jehovah Rapha. The healer's here. The healer is here. I drive out sickness. 
in the name of Jesus. A disease in the name of Jesus. Healing, come. I speak healing to your bodies. Healing to your mind. I set you at rest. In the name of Jesus. Set you at peace. Shalom. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, there's some of you that you're, you're so worried about some things that are pending. The Lord, the Lord is instructing me to tell you that he's working on that. He's working on it. It's not going to turn out as bad as you think. I remember this happened to me. He fixed something for me. I remember that I was supposed to transfer money out to a different account or I was going to get charged a whole year's interest. I forgot to do it. I was on the airplane. I go, oh, Lord. I said, I said, please fix it. And he said, I already have. So when I got home, I called the bank. I said, you know, I need to turn myself in. I apologize. I forgot to transfer it over. And is there any way you, your bank can give me a waiver? I don't want to have to pay the whole year's interest. It was thousands of dollars. And um, they said, well, Mr. Zeta, let's look it up. They said, well, on Tuesday of the deadline date at 1030 a.m., you called and you, you switched it. Okay. So very, very gingerly, I, I backed out. I said, can you just send me a receipt? Of that? You know, have a good day. Have a good day. And I said, Lord, what just happened? He goes, I knew you would pray. So on credit, I answered your prayer. I, I'm serious. I had to have it. Do you have anything you want to share? Okay, I'll keep prophesying if you want. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, okay. Somotokurash evit na zitomo uta, hele evundo, rivi sat nushupu kush and ele evu, breshte nomoko remete motopo kustaba, jevo, 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 jan tan tan te, ha 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 ha, ha ha ha, ha ha ha. <laughs> I reached down into the depths and pulled you out. And it would have been enough for me to put you on the shore. But I have put you in a high place. I said a safe high place where you are secure. Ha, ha, ha. And the enemy cannot touch you. Ha, ha, ha. Now, this, this is the operation of the Spirit. Some can pray in tongues, some can interpret. This is not your personal life of prayer. When you pray in the Spirit, Paul said, everyone, you're praying out mysteries, but no one understands what you're saying. So he said, in a public uh, congregation type thing, I would rather you prophesy in an intelligible language that everyone understands so that everyone's built up than speak in tongues where no one knows what you're saying unless it's interpreted. So unless it's interpreted, publicly you should you should speak in an, in, an, in an intelligible language but i can pray to myself to build myself up and then i can interpret my tongues and then tell you so that's what i do i'm praying in tongues all the time while i'm talking to you but you can't hear me because i can hear my in my spirit it's a different realm so i can do multiple things at multiple times i could build noah's ark in my garage and be here preaching to you <laughs> in my mind you know you're, you're already thinking about what you're going to eat you could do all these multitaskings. But see, in the spirit, there's multi levels of operation. But if they're all in the spirit, and it's all to unify the body. So you're being built up. But see, I could pray over every one of you. Please don't ask me to. But I can pray in tongues over each one of you and interpret. And I can tell you what the spirit's saying. But the thing it is, is I noticed people weren't writing it down and doing what Paul told Timothy. Wage war with the prophecies you received. That's what Paul told Timothy in chapter one of, 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 of first or second Timothy. That's what he told him. See, people are, are like, oh, you know, I got a word. And what was it? Uh, I don't remember. I'll have to buy the tape. And it's like, well, how are you going to wage war when the devil comes and says, you're not getting that? See, if he comes to you and tells you you're not getting that, you know you're getting it because he's a liar. So you turn it on him. See, the operation of the spirit is you turn it. 
See, it has already turned in your favor. The war has already turned in your favor. Because you're here. Not because I'm here, but you got here and God met us here. He's chosen me to be the vessel, but it might be somebody else next year. But if, as long as that person yields to the Spirit, the, the, the job will be done. But see, the thing of it is, you got to grasp the realities that are in the Spirit. Now, I saw so many things up there. I'm never going to be able to write all the books. I'm never going to be able to do all the albums. I'm not going to be able to do all of them. But I'm going to do the best I can. But see, if I can get other people to do it, then we'll all get those same the songs down from heaven that are up there that need to be released into this realm and all the books and all the subjects that need to be released into this realm. It's time. And, and he told me that the kids will do it if the adults won't. Amen. Did you know that God desires to speak to you? In John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Dr. Kevin Zadai has created a brand new, revelatory teaching that will help you to learn to hear God's voice clearly and speak out His mysteries and perfect will for your life. Take part in this special offer today and you will receive Dr. Kevin Zadai's study guide, an exclusive two CD set. You can hear God's voice. Kevin's study guide will help you to break down the barriers that interfere with hearing from God and give you the tools to become a more intimate follower of Jesus, bearing much fruit and walking in the authority that He has provided for you. In his exclusive two CD set, Kevin will share how you can hear God's voice for yourself and praise impartation prayers over you so that your heart will be open to receiving all that God has for you. Order this exclusive offer today and you will also receive Dr. Kevin Zadai's Soaking CD, Awakening. This soaking CD will help to create an atmosphere for you to enjoy the presence of God as you learn to hear His voice. To order, call 188-340-1460 with offer code 1001 or go online to kevinsadi.com slash offer. Order today Kevin's brand new study guide and exclusive two CD set. You can hear God's voice and his soaking CD awakening for a donation of $29. Don't miss out on this special offer.